And when we were dealing with the fall and the entry into the world of sin, I would explain to the teenagers that the opposite of being a sinner was to be perfect. And then I would say, is anyone here perfect? And there were always two or three likely lads who put their hand up, whereupon the rest of the class shot them down in flames, saying things like, what about that woman you mugged? What about that cat you knocked off the wall with a clothes prop? What about those cigarettes you nicked from the corner shop? None of us are perfect. And the good news is that Jesus is the sinner's friend. He, with the Father and the Holy Spirit, shone in glory in God's presence before the world began. He created the universe. The heavens are the work of his fingers. The sun, the moon, the stars. He calls them by name. He set them in space and from that glorious realm where Jesus dwelt and where God lives in unapproachable light, where beauty and obedience are perfect in that supreme realm, the glorious kingdom, Jesus chose to leave heaven's perfection and come down to enter our realm, planet Earth, the realm of sin and death. Jesus came into the realm where he could be tempted. Imagine, oh, that stoop of God. In glory, he was never misunderstood. From endless ages, angels knew what he meant as soon as he spoke. But he came down to a fallen world like this, and on earth was constantly misunderstood by his most faithful followers. On earth, he was suspected by the very people that he came to bless and rejected by the very people who owed to him their being and whose salvation he had come to seek. I find this truly remarkable. The endurance of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, his steadfastness, his perseverance, his tenacity. He made himself nothing. He humbled himself. He laid aside his reputation when he came and stood by me. He humbled himself to obedience, even the obedience of the cross. And there's a prayer that talks about the gentle use of his great powers. The Lord Jesus is so gentle, he could have called 10,000 angels when they arrested him in the garden. There was nothing obvious that this was God in the flesh. When Judas brought the gang to arrest him in the Garden of Gethsemane, there was no halo shining over the head of Jesus. In the dark, he looked like any other young Jewish man. He had to be identified, the one whom I kiss. He is the one. But the gentle use of his great powers he could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free. He could have called 
10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and me. And in that gospel song, the last verse says this, to the howling mob he yielded, he did not for mercy cry. The cross of shame he took alone. And when he cried, it's finished, he gave himself to die. Salvation's wondrous plan was done. He could have called 10,000 angels. He is the king of saints and the king of angels. He could have summoned them yes. to destroy the world and set him free. He could have, but he didn't. He died alone for you and me. He is the sinner's friend. No one ever loved you like the Lord Jesus Christ. If you enjoy a happy home with parents who love you, Jesus loves you even more. If you're privileged to be in a happy and successful marriage, however much your husband or wife loves you and cares for you, Jesus Christ loves you more. He came down from the glorious kingdom to live on earth and to win your love. He died for you that your sin might be fixed there on that cross, pinned to the cross with him. And you might be able through faith in him to live a new life, risen life, resurrection life glorious life. We read in Psalm 107 about four different groups of people who were in different circumstances but times got tough and when they had their back against the wall whatever the circumstance we read this then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he saved them from their distress. Why is it that very often God is our last resort? Why is it he is our last port of call? I've tried everything else and sometimes it's with a shrug of the shoulders and we say, oh well, might as well pray, it won't do any harm. If only we knew what good it would do. Right. Never say to someone, you want to come to church, come along to church, it won't do you any harm. That's not true. If you don't believe, it will start to harden your heart in unbelief and it will do you harm. The same sun that melts the ice, hardens the clay. So don't say, oh, come to church, it won't do you any harm. Truth is, it might do you some eternal good. Amen. If you mix it with faith, if you put your trust in Christ, you'll discover that new life is on offer to you. What do I have to do? Believe. 